Now, just to let you know, I am uh, James Watt today, and I'll explain why James Watt is tied up to Camille House as we go along. Just to give you an idea of uh, the time and history we are, uh, the Jacobites are about, I was born in 1736, the Jacobites are just about to rise up with Bonnie Prince Charlie in uh, 1745, the Battle of Culloden 1746. So that period's there. And we have a beard that's born within my lifetime, Robbie Burns. So that's the period we're in at this time. Okay, so I was born, as I say, in 1736 in a little fishing village a bit run down called Greenock. Although I must say, it might have been a wee bit run down, but I came from the, the better side of life, shall we say. <laughs> uh, my grandfather was a mathematician. He had a wee school where he taught people if they paid well enough. My father was a shipwright, very successful selling parts to ships. He had uh, shares and boats and ships and he was very successful. My mother, uh, Agnes, came from nobility. So we had connections and really I was born into quite a nice life. So I was quite happy with that. I was home taught by my mother. She was very well educated. Of course my grandfather taught me maths. My father was involved in instrumentation for the, the, the ships, so I understood from an early age about precision in instruments. My father gave me one time, as a present, a toolbox. When I get toys for Christmas and birthdays and such like, I used to take them all apart. It was great fun. Do you ever do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I used to put them back in a different shape and make them all different. <laughs> yeah, you do that too. Yes. You've got potential. <laughs> So I used to play about from an early age, I loved the mechanics of all my toys and such like. So I was brought up really in quite a nice way. I had money, I had a nice home, and then things started to go wrong for me. Unfortunately, my father got ill, through his business, was collapsing round about. His investment in one particular ship, it was uh, very expensive ship, there's problems with it, we get sued, and all the money was lost. My inheritance was lost. When I was 17, my beloved mother died, and I was left having to make a living. <coughs> Within a couple of years, I decided what I was going to do, like all people in the know, I'll go to London and make my fortune. So off I went to London when I was 17. It took me two weeks to get there. What a long journey. Two weeks. Be easier if I had a train. But they didn't exist at the time. <laughs> but never mind. So off I went to London and I worked hard. It was precision tools, scales, measuring instruments. I fixed them. I knew what I was doing. I was good at it. But I worked day and night and day and night. And this was through all my lifetime. I worked hard but I made myself ill. And I had to come back up to uh, from London. I came back to Glasgow. And when I came back to Glasgow, I wanted to make these instruments. I wanted to repair all these precision instruments. But the Guild of Hammermen decided that I wasn't qualified. They wouldn't allow me to, to trade. They wouldn't allow me to work. So I had to do an apprentice, an apprenticeship to get my paper so I could work. There was no one in Scotland as skilled as me. I couldn't do my apprenticeship, so I couldn't get the papers and trade in the business that I could do. I was too advanced for the time in Scotland. Luckily, I got a job in Glasgow University. The professors and the doctors there took me in because they knew of my skills and I could repair the instruments they needed in the university. And as time came on through university, I started to meet people. People like John, uh, my friend John, who introduced me to steam and they wanted me to make instruments to work with some of the steam products they had at the, the university and they had a Newcomb, a Newcomb steam engine there, just a model one, just a small one, but they asked me to repair it and I did repair it, but I quickly realised that it was very inefficient, it didn't work very well. I had a job to do, but it wasn't very good at that. Through that, 
I was introduced to Robert Black, who's already working in this field, and we worked together for a while at the university, and I started to understand the, the steam engine, the Newcomb steam engine. Mm. It was very simple. Yeah, is it? It was very simple. And I started to work, and I thought, I could improve in this. And between Robert and myself, we came up with this idea. It was mainly me. I was walking through the park just like this in Glasgow one time. And it was like one of these eureka moments. If I could take the steam, the hot and cold system from this steam engine that I've got at the moment, and I put what I eventually called a condenser at the side, I could make this whole thing much more efficient. So the idea came and I worked it all out and I knew it could work. But I couldn't do it at the university. And my friend, Robert, Robert Black, he introduced me to Dr. John Roebuck. Now, Dr. John Roebuck, he was an industrialist. He was an inventor. He was a man with means. And he leased the coal mines, the salt mines. And he leased this house. He had lots of money and he was going forward. But I was introduced to him because he had one particular problem. The mines around here were getting saturated. And these pumps, these, these um, boilers, uh, the engines, were used to take the water out of the mines, but they weren't very efficient, they couldn't lift very high with the water. So he knew what I was doing, I spoke to him, and in 1768 we got together working on a project and he built a cottage at the back here. Now, when you have a look at the cottage, you'll see it's not very comfortable, and the pole wasn't even a bed in it, it was a workshop, so it's not a house that he stayed in, it was a workshop. And we came together and we got this uh, idea going and we had it patented in 1769. And 1769 is a very important year for us. Just previous to that, I get married. Uh, I've had five children. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Three of them died in childhood. Uh, two went on to adulthood. And one of, them, I, one of the children died before I... Um, I died later on, but uh, and that, that, that story is through all my life. I seem to outlive an awful lot of my friends and partners and wife and children. Anyway, the patent came along and at that time, I wouldn't say it was a race to uh, try and develop the, the boiler systems it was, but there were people, there were certain people around about spying on me, so I did a lot of things in secrecy. Even with the patent, I was worried. And there's one story, story of a man, uh, Hatley, I think his name was, who was in the Arctic somewhere. Do you know what part of the Arctic? Hadrian, where he fits? Who was that? This, uh, the spy in the Arctic? No, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know where the Arctic, Arctic is. No. But somewhere around it here, he was in the Arctic spying down, trying to get Watt's idea. So there's a lot of people trying to steal his ideas, but he kept it secret. So he came here. He was here for six years, roughly. And uh, within that time, he was working with Roebuck, and Roebuck owned the uh, uh, car and iron foundry up there, I think cannons and such like. So he had a work shift there, uh, a workforce there, which he was using to try and develop his boilers. But one thing he needed, he needed precision engines, he needed precision tooling, he needed smooth bore, he needed the piston sealing properly in that. And frustration after frustration, because every time he tried, he worked on one project for a year and a half, and it didn't work. He just didn't have the precision. The engineers here were not so much precision engineers as smiddies. They weren't, he needed this precision and it just wouldn't come through to him up here. So it failed. And during this period, Roebuck invested all this money in the mines and that, but it was still flooding. And eventually Roebuck got, uh, went bust. Watt had to go out and work. He worked in the canals and such like, round about trying to make money. Until it got to the point that Roebuck well, I should have mentioned, the reason Roebuck took him on is that uh, Watt wasn't a businessman. He was an engineer, and all through his life he wasn't a businessman. He was in debt up to his eyes. And Roebuck took him on, he paid his debts off, and they patented this condenser uh, on the, the engine. Roebuck took two thirds of that patent, which is a gamble. It sounds a lot, and it is a lot. If we knew it was going to be sent, uh, uh, successful, yes, it was a lot. But he took this risk on because 
everyone thought it was worthless. This patent was worthless. That's what they thought. He took it on, he did get into debt, he went bust, and he sold this patent to a company in Birmingham, Gotham. And they got together there, and that story I will continue just shortly. But what finished up here at Keneal House, he loved his time here, but because of his invention not working, he did suffer from depression such like, and he fight his wife saw him through that. So for the time being, I'm going to leave Keneal House, and I might meet you later on and I'll tell you what happens uh, from then onwards. Okay, enjoy this with yourself, enjoy around Keneal House.